I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. The Victorian Premier surprised the nation on Tuesday with his decision to pull the pin on the 2026 Commonwealth Games. Before winning his third term in office, Dan Andrews had promised a Games like no other, based in regional Victoria. And only a couple of months ago, taxpayers were being assured the price tag was still affordable at less than $3 billion. But the Premier now says that cost has blown out dramatically. The event will not go ahead. Games officials are outraged. They dispute the costings and are scrambling to find a new host. Sporting bodies and athletes are deeply disappointed. The Prime Minister expressed his shock. But amid a cost of living and housing crisis, the Premier is making a virtue of his priorities. Coming up, I'll be joined by the acting opposition leader, Susan Lee. First, our panel, Patricia Carvelis, Jacob Grieber and Anna Henderson. Look, um, PK, let's start with the, the figures that Dan Andrews is talking about here. This is a little hard to scrutinise, uh, the six to seven billion dollars he's talking about, because at the moment, at least, there's just not a lot of transparency around them. No, and that, that's the big problem here, that the lack of transparency is quite confounding, actually. I don't understand why there has been such a lack of transparency. The question you opened with, I think, is an important one. Why did the government want the Commonwealth Games in the first place? What's now, the, the biggest. That, do you think? Uh, well, it was before an election campaign. Uh, Victoria had suffered a really difficult period during uh, multiple lockdowns. Now, regional Victoria remained open, right? Often. But guess what? No one from Melbourne could visit. So the tourism numbers were right down. Um, the regions really struggled. So and this is a good way of showing people still like us, people still want to come here, we can still put on a big show. Now, I am the Victorian on the panel and I can tell you we're very proud of our sport mm -hmm. and, uh, we, and Daniel Andrews knew that. He wanted to send a message to Victorians that we were going to be back on the map when it came to, you know, hosting big sporting events. And also it was a message to the regions. Remember he wanted a very unique regional kind of games that all of the suffering that they'd gone through, and it had been immense, not being able to take visitors, particularly from Melbourne or interstate or internationally, would be remedied. But the point is uh, that no one really beyond the people who may have had an advantage from getting the games and seeing tourism numbers increase for that period of time really wanted the games. The biggest joke in Melbourne over the last week has been, oh, did we have the Commonwealth Games? <laughs> Sorry, but that's true. Yeah. Now, this figure you asked me about, between six to seven billion dollars. We don't know where that comes from. It's being highly contested. Look, I do think there's probably been a pretty significant uh, blowout in costs. That's that's normal. That, that's that normal. happens with uh, you know pretty much all of these big multi-sport events, Olympic Games, Commonwealth mm -hmm. Games. But um, Jacob, I mean, how e even factoring in you know inflation and construction costs, which everyone can see, how credible do you think that six to seven billion dollar well, figure is? I mean. Patricia's right, these numbers are always fudgy when it comes to Olympics and games and how much they cost. But this doesn't make sense that it jumped by that much. And the problem is, and he was warned about it, he wanted to have this in every village in Victoria. He wanted bread and circuses in every village in Victoria. And that's going to cost a lot more. He was told that by the people who organise these games. Um, and so, of course, the thing's blown out. Uh, and maybe people are a little bit indifferent to the Commonwealth Games, but there's still going to be a really big break fee that Victorians are going to have to pay And we pay don't know what them. that is yet. We right? have that, no idea what that is. That's what's being but, negotiated. But there are contract lawyers who are suggesting it's well over a billion dollars. So this is not, this is not trivial mm -hmm. to just turn this off. The, the, on the figure, though, um, Anna, he's really framing this, the Premier, as about putting schools and hospitals and, and yep. public housing first when it comes to how much this is going to cost. Six to seven billion dollars is well and truly too much for a 12-day sporting event. Uh, I will not take money out of hospitals and schools in order to fund an event that is three times the cost uh, as estimated and budgeted for last year. And fair enough, most people I'm sure aren't going to want to see money taken out mm. of schools and hospitals, but uh, as, we, as we saw, the Commonwealth Games Association certainly isn't buying this six to seven billion dollar figure. The Victorian Government willfully ignored recommendations to move events to purpose-built stadia in, in Melbourne and in fact remain wedded to proceeding with expensive temporary venues in regional Victoria. Gold Coast was 1.2 billion, uh, billion to run the Games, I think Birmingham was 1.8. Um, so I'm not sure how we get a, a leap of more than double of that to run the games. I, it's, I, I find that a little hard to believe. 
Spizzy, we're seeing a situation where it's sort of the political handling of the announcement that's had an impact too, to come out and essentially what it seems like is blindside the people involved who've been working really hard on this. Yes, the majority of Australians were possibly not even aware we were having a Commonwealth Games, but the people for whom this is really important, part of their planning and their future, uh, to come out and just make this surprise announcement. The Prime Minister says he had very little heads up that it was happening. Uh, and then for there not to really be another solution leading to these uh, claims, you know, what happens to the Commonwealth? Commonwealth Games from here. Is anyone else, is any other country going to be able to step in and salvage this at all? Yeah, well, do you think he would have been able to do this had it been the Olympic Games or a World Cup? Uh, you only do this uh, because yeah. it's the Commonwealth Don't mess Games. with the Women's World Cup where they're spending the Commonwealth $86 million. Um, I don't know many Australians that would argue that that's not money well spent at the moment. So we are having a debate about government money subsidising sport, but the truth is some sports are just better than others. Well, they are, and, like, the World Cup, the comparison's unavoidable, right, because it's on right now when this decision on the Commonwealth Games has been announced, but it has, as I said, a huge, huge international audience, and we don't have to build new stadiums uh, yeah. to host it. It's, it's different, Jacob, isn't it? With... Well, we, we didn't need to for the Commonwealth Games either. I mean, to go back to my previous point. This, this, was, this, was, this was a political ploy before an election to win favour with Victorians, and it's going to cost them a fortune. And, and by the way, it's going to cost the rest of us mm. some money too. Every time we visit Victoria now, we're going to have to pay for a bed tax. I mean, $2 billion still goes into the regional yes. parts of yeah. the state. Yeah. There's still a housing, 1,300 additional houses being built. That's less than the 2.6 that was going to be spent on the Commonwealth Games, but it's still something But for many people, particularly after growing up in a regional area, like, people really care about investment in their regions. It, it makes a difference. So how this plays out and lead up to another election, Will be really Look, and the election in Victoria is a really long way away. Yeah. So it might not matter. It's the right timing to make that. <laughs> it's, I guess we the, just bigger, one? the bigger question right now, um, and also looking at what happened earlier this year with the Hobart Stadium that the mm. federal and the Tasmanian government promised, there's a huge community backlash over that, saying we'd rather have housing, thank you, mm. than, than a shiny stadium. Is there a shift, do you think, when it comes to the politics of big sporting facilities or big sporting events? A hundred percent, yes. And, and and it's about the times we're in as well. So, and, and Daniel Andrews made that point, right? I mean, he's he, he has historically been quite good at politics, this guy. <laughs> he's very good at winning elections. Um, look at the last election uh, where he won um, and people really, you know, were saying he should be on the nose and yet, look, he won after all of those lockdowns at a very difficult time. But his argument... Um, goes down to the fact that people are really struggling with basic things. So the idea of spending, you know, lots of money on big sporting events, I just don't think pa passes the so-called pub test. Mm. But I made the Women's World Cup point. I think there are some things that you invest in which clearly are showing some big social dividend as well. Like, for instance, the Women's World Cup at the moment, you know, has gone off, right? And look how it's inspiring young people and particularly young girls. We know that it's having an incredibly positive social impact. So I do think there are exceptions, but when there are big profitable sports like the AFL um, that I do think, you know, is, can I just be blunt, gaming the system. Like, the, the AFL is, is not struggling. They're not on squeezing, struggle squeezing street. Squeezing taxpayers. They right. are, and, and that's what that Tasmanian example demonstrates to mm -hmm. me. What about the role of federal funding in this Commonwealth Games decision? Nothing had been nailed down, nothing had been committed. Victoria asked initially for a 50-50 split. They were never going to get that. But my understanding is the Commonwealth was looking at a roughly 10% mm. uh, contribution, which is what happened in the 2018 Commonwealth Games. But waiting for the business case. Yeah. I think they were waiting for the business case. It wasn't in right. this budget because they were waiting for more information from Victoria. And then the new information was actually, we're not going to go ahead. They did was get this some more information, though. Uh, right. They did. And then the cancellation. Mm. So they too are scratching their But was this a decisive factor in the decision, do you think, the, the role of federal funding? It, Dan Andrews says it wasn't. Uh, well, he says it wasn't. So we can only go by the public um, comments he makes. Mm. Uh, I think that they, they just he just didn't want to spend this money anymore because I just think the, the state's finances are being crunched. But again, it goes back to the original point. Don't make the promise to start with. Uh, it was probably quite obviously always mm. a problematic idea and 
you know, you've got to be solid on your word. And I think it's interesting how it's playing out federally to just yeah. one... Sorry, but the... the the brand damage to Labor, and we're hearing this from the federal Liberals, oh, the PM should intervene, mm. brand Labor. And I think you'll, you've noticed that the, comp, the Labor Party federally is, like, distancing themselves very much, aren't they? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a really shabby affair. Um, and it's, it, it's that sort of government by press release that the former federal government was accused of doing over and over again. And you've got a really big example of it now at the state level, and it's damaging the Labor brand. But it didn't resonate in the UK. The front pages didn't carry a, a dramatic uh, story about it. it. It was covered, but it wasn't a huge issue uh, in the country where you might expect uh, there might be more to say. So in terms of that... The only other country that appears to be able to afford to host these things, right? Well, well the second country on the medal table, that's the other issue. You know, Australia often wipes the floor at the Commonwealth Games. It's, it's not an, a world event. So for many sports, apart from lawn bowls, I'm told, there are other big international competitions that are, are more even than the Commonwealth Games. And so it doesn't affect in the same way the athletes' preparation for those big events. All right. Well, uh, time to talk to the acting opposition leader, Susan Lee, our guest this morning. And to take us there, here was the opposition turning this into a test of leadership for the Prime Minister. This is Australia's reputation that has been damaged. So therefore, the Australian government needs to step up and make sure that it protects our international reputation. This goes far past just our sporting reputation. This goes to the sovereign risk of doing business with Australia. So I think Anthony Albanese, by his refusal to engage on this at all, as, in, as his sport minister has refused to engage, needs to step up and show some leadership. It is a national issue. It is about Australia's reputation. It is about brand Australia. And when I listen to the athletes this morning on your program and others, I mean, it's heartbreaking when you consider what they've, what they've done in terms of their training, what this means for mm. them. And we actually need a Prime Minister who takes responsibility for Australia's reputation when it comes to sport. I take the Victorian Government um, at, at face value in terms of um, the decision they've made and the factors that went into that and you know they've described not just a, a small potential overrun but but really uh, a significant difference in what they believed would be the ultimate cost in delivering the games um, as against what they believed would be the cost when they first walked down the path of pursuing the game so um, I, I don't I don't doubt that and, um, and and I do respect the decision that's been made there is a sense of disappointment clearly um, but but we get it and 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 um, it's, uh, it's now, I think, a matter of moving on. And, and for those of us who live in regional Victoria, I think it's a matter of working with the Victorian government to see that the benefits, that the lasting benefits beyond the Games, which were being promised as part of the Games, actually come to pass. Susan Lee, welcome to the program. You've said you want the Prime Minister to take responsibility uh, on this. What does that mean? Do you want the federal government to pick up the tab for these Games? Well, David, if our athletes behaved like Daniel Andrews and Anthony Albanese, we wouldn't win any gold medals because those two, frankly, have just given up. So there is no leadership from this Prime Minister and there are many things that he could be doing to restore our international reputation. Like By the way, where is Annika Wells, the sports minister? Happy to pop up in a photo op with the Matildas during the week, but nowhere to be seen, missing in action, radio silence. You just heard Richard Miles bumbling and stumbling, nothing to do with us. There really is an issue of Australia's international reputation. This is an international embarrassment. So just coming back to the question, do you want the federal government to pick up the tab? I want both Daniel Andrews and Anthony Albanese to explore creative solutions. The problem with like, this is like it's, what? been, What's a creative it's been presented solution? as a binary choice, David. It's been presented as it costs $7 billion or you don't have it at all. Mm. How about looking at alternatives? How about looking at other states, other nations stepping in? How about having the reasonable conversation with the Commonwealth Games Federation about how we can help, how we can take responsibility? Now, the Commonwealth supported financially the Gold Coast Games and no doubt they would have tipped some money into this as well. Mm. We don't know the details of that conversation. But I don't accept that as our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, can simply step back and take no responsibility. And I've got a suggestion, by the way, for all of the athletes. Don't have your photo taken with any Labor MPs until this gets sorted out. Right. There should be a, what, a, a blockade, a ban on any photo opportunity. Well, there should, be, there should be a really strong message going to the Prime Minister, 
already there's a strong message going to Daniel Andrews that this is just not good enough. The Prime, the Prime Minister, though, he didn't uh, bid for these games. This was not his mm -hmm. idea. But you're saying he now should, what, take charge of sorting out where the Commonwealth Games should be held in 2026? He should take some responsibility. I'm not saying he should put the games on at Commonwealth costs at any, you know, uh, any cost. I'm not saying that at all. So I'm what saying exactly explore, should he do? Explore creative solutions, which might include the states around Australia contributing, another country contributing, at least look for an outcome that restores our international reputation. Okay. Because where it is right now is pretty low and that affects everyone and Do you think, elite though, we, sport we, we, matters, we, David. Yeah, we've, got a, we've got a big elite sport event going on right now and, and it's going pretty well so far. Do you really think this has damaged Australia? Absolutely I do. I used to be the sports minister. I know the role that elite sport plays, not just at the level of that sport, but for every community, for those regional Victorian communities, for those children who see our athletes as their future inspiration, for what it does for activity, for society, for culture, uh, let alone the broken promises that the Premier's made. I mean, they've been talked about enough. So it actually does matter. The Commonwealth Games, the World Championships, the Olympic Games, they're all part of our international standing. And that's a responsibility this Prime Minister needs to actually take seriously. Let's turn to uh, cost of living pressures. You've been uh, flying around the country this week talking about uh, cost of living. You've visit, uh, visited the Scarborough Boat Harbour Brewery up in Queensland, uh, the Brunetti's Cake Shop down in Melbourne as well. Amongst those lining up for uh, boutique beers and, and tiramisu, did you run into anyone really struggling on Job Seeker? I did. I ran into small businesses who were really struggling. I was in Malvern in, in Melbourne and I saw a strip of shops which were just one for lease sign after the other. I walk into small businesses every day in the places you've mentioned and in other locations where people say they haven't had any customers. They show me their electricity bill, they show me their rent bill. They tell me how difficult it is. And I don't think this government is taking the cost of living seriously. We handed them an economy that was record low in employment with a resources boom. What unfortunately they have done is not look properly at a plan to manage inflation. And what they've done is introduce risk into the economy. Their ham-fisted intervention in the electricity, in the energy market. They're playing with industrial relations. And the effect that this is having, I'm seeing the effect of what they've done since they came into government well, one, uh, on our small yeah. businesses and workers. The question is about job seeker, And one of the things they're trying to do is increase the rate of job seeker. This was announced in the May budget. Have you decided yet whether to support that? Well, Peter Dutton talked about people who are on JobSeeker being able to earn more mm. I'll come and to therefore that, he... encourage them back into the workforce. Mm. So I think that's a good thing. Well, all right, well just on that, mm. given you've raised it, this was the centrepiece announcement from Peter Dutton in his mm. budget reply back in May. Do you know yet what that would cost? We know that it would introduce productivity into the workplace. But what would we'll it go, cost? We'll, we'll go through those costings. But right now... You don't now, have them yet? Well, businesses are crying out for workers, David. All of those costings and all of those policy details will come. But politicians need some... to know what something costs before committing to it, surely. But more importantly, they need to attach themselves to a principle. The principle here is that the economy has record low unemployment and that for you as an individual, your pathway to a better place in life is always through a job. Let's help you. But don't you Let's not to... punish you. Don't Let's you not demonise you. Out... Let's support you. Don't you need to work out what something costs, though? And we will. And I'm quite relaxed about a strong policy position when will we that see backs that? in our job seekers in due course. Right. When will we see the cost of it? Well, we'll see the cost in due course. It's not for me to actually give you a date here on your program. But so it, it is, is for still me. Coming. It is still coming. It is. But it is for me to say that these principles, another one we took was the pensioner workforce bonus, how we break down barriers to employment so we can make the workforce more productive. This is critical because this is what we need to do right, to actually add productivity where the government is taking it away. If the government won't take up that uncosted idea, will you still vote for or against their increase in job seeker? Let's see the legislation. Let's have a close look at it. But the principle is the one I want to come back to, David, which is that we often talk about the amount that people get paid on JobSeeker, and I know it's really tough. But I also know that when we have so many jobs and so many um, mm. businesses desperate to fill those jobs, there is a job for someone and there is a training pathway for someone and there is support for someone. And if we can help you by saying you can earn more while you're on Job Seeker, that's a good thing for you. I'm looking at the social benefit here. You've been talking too a lot about energy prices and the Coalition's uh, answer to this now appears to be going nuclear mm. uh, and you've become a convert on this too. As Environment Minister, you rejected a push from some of your colleagues to lift the ban on nuclear power in Australia. Why have you had a 
change of heart in opposition? Next generation nuclear makes sense. If you look at the way the energy market is being smashed, which means households and businesses are being smashed right now with rising electricity prices, what we need to do is de-risk investment in the energy market. We need to boost supply, particularly of gas, and we need to have a serious look at nuclear. People are changing their mind, David. I saw a poll in Warringah, I think last week, where more than 50% of people, particularly young people, are saying they want to see nuclear as part of the energy mix for the future. So, so it absolutely it, yeah. makes sense for clean baseload energy. The only problem is, you, like the CSIRO, for example, says it's far too expensive. So what's convinced you to change your mind? The next generation nuclear, the safety of it, the way that both small modular reactors and micro modular reactors are being considered by 50 countries around the world, the level of the debate. And look, Australians, just like me, David, are up for the conversation. So it's just that general level of debate that's changed your mind? It's, it's, the, it's the reality, the reality of the safety of next generation nuclear. Even and though some fact, of the authorities here are saying it well, doesn't stack I, up. I think a lot of people are moving in a direction that actually is very positive about nuclear, just as I am. And if we want that clean baseload power and we genuinely want to reduce emissions, I say renewables need all the help they can get. Mm. I want to see renewables taken up in Australia. I want to see that pathway. I don't agree with the way the government is, as I said, smashing households and businesses in a way that actually makes them close down, makes them unaffordable, sends manufacturing overseas. We need, so, to do this. Yeah, okay. we need to do this sensibly. So is the, idea, part of the solution. is the idea with nuclear then, um, as I understand it, to have, the, have these reactors based where old coal-fired power stations are, so the Latrobe Valley, the Hunter Valley, they would be locations for well, nuclear people, power? People have talked about that and they sound quite sensible, but that's the next stage of the debate. Debate. We actually need a government that's up for the conversation. Mm. Australians are up for the conversation, the Labor Party is not. The way they sneer and ridicule the genuine concern and commitment of average Australians about having clean baseload energy, and you, you would that be would be nuclear. To, you would be prepared to lift the ban on nuclear power in Australia? Well, that's part of it. And by the way, that has to happen, that actually has to happen anyway with AUKUS. So the government's being a bit tricky here. Um, well, we're talking about the ban on domestic use. Yes, we are. And, it, and, and obviously it's part of that. So it's you would lift that debate. ban? You have to. You have to, okay. you have to remove or alter that provision in the EPBC Act. Right, so that's now coalition policy. Well, let's wait and see what the government proposes. It's not about whether it's coalition policy or not. It was something I was looking at as Environment Minister with respect to the AUKUS initiative okay. that we brought in when we were in government, David. Let's turn to the uh, voice to Parliament. The Liberal Party wants to legislate an Indigenous voice. Can I ask why do you think Australia needs such a body? We need, as parliamentarians and as organisations across this country, to do all we can to close the gap, the gap in Indigenous disadvantage. So we want, I want, to see constitutional recognition of our first Australians. We've had that on our policy platform since John Howard when I came into Parliament. The problem is that Anthony Albanese has tied that constitutional recognition of our first Australians to a concept called the voice, which he cannot explain. My question is about why you think we need a voice, a legislated voice. Why do you think we need it? We would discuss what the legislated voice looked like and how it operated. Remember, we started local and regional voices when we were in government. So I have actually seen the way this has played out in regional mm. communities. What difference would it make? I mean, there's an argument from the no case that this would be uh, more bureaucracy. We'd have a layer of bureaucracy. Mm. We've got too much bureaucracy. but. You do want this legislated voice. You don't think that would be unnecessary bureaucracy? Well, we would do it and we would support a model that didn't have unnecessary bureaucracy. So the voice is important in the way that it may close the gap and it way, it, in the way it may improve the lives of Indigenous right. people. But remember, there are a lot of organisations, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that are already in place. I've watched many of them over the years. But you think the voice could close the gap. Do you think it would re-racialise Australia as well, having a uniquely Indigenous voice to Parliament or not? Look, it's not an expression I'd use. I would always see it in terms of local communities and the practical outcomes that make a difference to them. And what I would like to see in a legislated voice is that local approach. I'm not seeing it. By the way, we don't know what the uh, constitutionally enshrined voice would look like because the Prime Minister seems to refuse to explain it. No, and we don't, we don't know what the legislated and, voice would look like either, but, but you, are, but you in, have said this morning... But you all think legislation... Would... Yeah, but, David, all legislation requires exposure drafts, sure. it requires conversations, it requires debate. I mean, it requires all 
all the things that actually produce good legislation at the end of a process. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see. But I want to see it link to local communities. So it's not no, one national body coming out of Canberra. It's a voice that comes from each community because every community has a different view and so they should. But you have said here this morning that you do think a voice could help close the gap. So what is the concern about enshrining that in the Constitution? The way that the unnecessary bureaucracy would be associated with a constitutionally enshrined voice. We've said that's risky, we've said it's unknown, we've said it's divisive and we've said it's yeah, permanent. Why do you think point... it's risky? What, just explain to me who you're relying on to suggest it would be risky the... to enshrine this in the Constitution. Well, when you talk about litigation through the High Court with executive power and the reach and influence of the voice, that to me adds risk. The risk is the slowing down but are you of business Are decisions. you relying on anyone's advice here? Because there's a long list of former High Court Chief Justice Robert French uh, who says there's little or no scope of constitutional litigation. Your Liberal colleague Julian Lisa who says this is safe change. I mean, experts from Brett Walker to Anne Toomey are all very comfortable with this. Who are you there's, relying on? There's experts saying lots of different things. Like who? What, well, there are experts in the Yes case who said things differently earlier on in the Yes case, and I don't want to name individuals. But in describing the reach and influence of the voice and the way that it would entrench bureaucracy and slow down decision making, that's what concerns me. Because I've seen how decisions in this country have been slowed down to the detriment of local communities. But that's not we, the view of most of these experts, the overwhelming majority of constitutional experts. Well, David, constitutional experts have their place. Ordinary Australians and their views also have their place. And by the way, this is a debate that needs to be between ordinary Australians. But so when you're talking I'm about not, constitutional risk... I'm not lecturing risk. anybody. No, but when you're talking about constitutional risk, as you are, surely you've got to listen to some constitutional experts. Mm. And the reach that the voice would have via the executive power of government and the description of how it would be able to influence every area of government tells me that it would have considerable power and that power would be risky, divisive and is unknown. Now, if all of this is going to work well, why hasn't Anthony Albanese called a constitutional convention? Why are well, he would we having argue that's the debate? What the Ulrich dialogues well, were. Well, well, he's saying, no, he's actually saying, we'll do this afterwards. You know what? If I was someone who supported the yes case, I'd be pretty disappointed in the Prime Minister right now. He's avoiding the question, not fighting for his point of view. You heard that this week on his interview on 2GB, where he got abrasive, he got snippy, he backed away. He said, oh, it's not about treaty, it's not about this. He didn't even step up with the courage of the argument that he should be having for the yes case. And as I said to Parliament, David, it's OK to vote yes. It's OK to vote no. I'll be voting no with a heavy heart because this is not the model that will produce the outcomes that I want to see and that I know are missing. Just finally, uh, on the challenge to your pre-selection, uh, people in leadership positions in the Liberal Party aren't often challenged for pre-selection. I think the last was John Hewson. Scott Morrison stepped in in the last term of Parliament to protect you from pre-selection. Do you think Peter Dutton should do the same? Well, David, it's a good question for you to ask and people are asking me those questions and you won't be surprised that I can't go into the details of um, party decisions and processes. I will say this, though, I've pr been proud to be the Liberal member for Farrah since 2001. I stand by my record. Um, anyone can put up their hand through a pre-selection process. I agree, it's a bit unusual. What I'm fighting for is the people that I meet every day. When I hear that more than 50% of Australians, if they got a bill unexpectedly today, they wouldn't be able to pay it. But I guess That's the, the, what gets yeah, me up and the, gets me driving The question me is, I, I suppose, in that everybody. process here, do, do you support a rank-and-file pre-selection or do you think the leader should step in again? Rank-and-file pre-selections absolutely should have their place okay. and if I go through that, I'll go through that. I can't talk about the details of it because the party rules prevent but Would you rather Peter Dutton that. step in and stop it? I'm very happy to put myself forward on my record as the Liberal member of my seat of Farrah okay. for 22 years. And David. is Peter Dutton supporting you? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, he is. Susan Lee, thanks very much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Well, coming up, what are universities going to look like in the future? The government has embarked on some higher education reform. We're going to talk about that. Let's return to our panel, though, right now. Patricia Carvelis, Jacob Grieber and Anna Henderson and a errant microphone. Uh, look, just to pick up on what we heard there, Patricia, the pre-selection contest, it is pretty rare to have a deputy leader facing a challenge from within the party. Mm. Um, those I've spoken to in the party suggest she'll be OK. Mm. Um, they expect this challenger, Jean Haynes, to maybe get 20, 30 per cent. But you don't know, right, with, with any sort of contest mm, like no. this. 
What do you think? How worried should Susan Lee be? Uh, look, I think it's more of a broader question for the Liberal Party. Here we have the most senior Liberal woman in their ranks, their deputy leader, a party that has diagnosed itself, by the way, in its own report, the, the Loch Nain Hume report after the election, with having an issue around gender that they must address. And what? They're trying to roll their deputy female leader? I mean, that's mm. extraordinary. It's hopeless, actually. It, it is. And as Julie and Lisa said on my program this week on RM Breakfast, just plugging my show there, um, no shame, but he, I, he, there was a story that Nikki Sava wrote, a column saying that he might also face a challenge. He says he's not facing that challenge, but in relation to his views supporting The Voice. And he made the point about Susan Lee that perhaps... Uh, all of these people might want to run in seats that the Liberals need to win at the next election. There are many seats that the Liberals lost. Look, I think she's probably going to be safe. At the end of the day, uh, I think Peter Dutton will probably intervene if it gets to that stage, just like Scott Morrison did. Uh, but I think it's a pretty extraordinary set of events that you would, you know, target uh, one of the more senior Liberal women in the party. I think it speaks to some bigger issues that some of the membership um, perhaps are having uh, that need to be addressed. I just think it's extraordinary. Yeah, right. Well, let's turn to the, uh, the jobs figures that we saw this week, Jacob. Red hot jobs market still 3.5% employment. What, what's going on here? I mean, 12 interest rate rises don't seem to have made much of an impact on no, no, the state yeah. of the labour market. It doesn't really feel like we're about to go into a recession with numbers like that, does it? No. And now, look, the jobs thing is to some extent a little backwards. It takes companies a long time to hire people. It's a process. It's rumbling along. Uh, there are signs the economy is slowing. Uh, hospitality, uh, uh, tourism, those sectors are getting hit hard, quick. But the jobs, the overall jobs market is still red hot. Um, there's an awful lot of spending happening still, awful lot of state and federal government spending happening uh, at the moment across the board. That's driving demand for jobs. And some economists are saying the only reason the jobless rate hasn't gone even lower and that, we're, w that we would be in the middle of a real price sort of spiral upwards is because we have high immigration. Mm -hmm. That's taking the, the edge off. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky conundrum for, for policy makers. Very difficult for the Reserve Bank to deal with this. Well, it is because we know the incoming governor, Michelle Bullock, has talked about needing a, or having a higher unemployment rate of 4.5% mm. uh, to, to have a sustainable economy. Tricky one for the government, though, uh, to, to back that sort of view in. Yes, that might be the forecast, but they don't want to see unemployment rise necessarily is the point they're making. And there's a real debate going on at the moment about what the Reserve Bank's um, aim should be, getting inflation down but also achieving full employment. And how do you define full employment seems to be the real sticking point. Anna. It's becoming awkward, isn't it? Because we know that that 4.5% is what Michelle Bullock has said. The RBA talks about uh, that band being in the low fours. But that means that Australians are going to lose their job. Despite these interest rate decisions, that's not happening. Where does this go? Do, does the government take on the ACTU's suggestion around changing what the definition of full employment is, making it uh, well, the, a lower the, figure? The, the, the ACTU want a definition of zero involuntary unemployment. Um, Jim Chalmers uh, told you during the week, PK, that he supports an objective of good, secure, well-paid jobs for everyone who wants one. Why do these definitions matter and is there a difference between the two there? Look... I think Jim Chalmers would argue that there is a difference between what he's saying and what the ACTU is saying. He hasn't backed in the ACTU's position, but there is a lot of nuance and grey here. Uh, there is a, a jobs paper that will be released in a few months setting out the government's kind of ideas and objectives around some of this. And it is a, it is a tricky one, but, you know, the RBA has also paused on rates a couple of times, still with unemployment at at the level it's at. So it's not sort of chasing it down. It's obviously looking at other factors as well. Um, but I think the ACTU is raising important questions, though, in the discussion about what we're happy to settle at in terms of an unemployment rate. I think people do know that things are getting harder, but when Jim Chalmers talks about these well-paid, you know, jobs... Yeah, secure jobs. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that a sort of legislated objective or is this a politician who's trying to 
uh, talk yeah. about something which I don't think many politicians would contest. Like, is a politician really, Jacob, going to say, oh, I'm against well-paid, secure jobs? Well, like, I mean, <laughs> in terms of the definition of full employment, you can redefine a donkey as a giraffe all you like. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem is still going to be you might create way too much wage pressure than you want uh, and the consequence of that will be higher interest rates and that will hurt the government just as much. So call it what you will. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an important debate uh, and, and the central bank and, and the incoming governor has made it clear that she thinks it's around that neutral rate, that awful Nauru concept that, you know, is hard to get a grasp on because you don't actually know what that is. This is the non-accelerating rate of inflation. Mm, which that, is in the low fours usually. She's suggesting it's in the fours. We're now three and a half. Mm. Uh, the government and the unions are sort of suggesting let's make the definition more about... Well, we don't uh, really know. But the government's employment. not denouncing her, her view, though. No, no. But and that's key. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the point is we, we don't really know. Mm. The inflation figures that are coming this week are going to be really interesting. Right? If they show yeah. um, that inflation is continuing to fall with this really low unemployment rate, it's, it's a similar thing to what's happening in the US actually Very at the moment so. as well. Yeah. Their jobs yeah. market's remaining red hot uh, yeah. while inflation's coming down. But so their maybe inflation's it's a new coming normal. down, yeah. Uh, anyway, during the week, the, the Treasurer also um, produced the first of these well-being budgets that he promised uh, in opposition. The idea here is to look beyond just the dry economic stats of CPI and unemployment and GDP and, and, and look at things that really matter uh, to people. 50 different indicators have been measured. Problem is, uh, some of them are quite a bit out of date. Uh, yeah. The idea that mortgage holders are finding dealing with their house costs uh, better. Uh, well, that, that, that's obviously not the case anymore. That's a few years old, that number. And the mental health numbers predate the COVID uh, pandemic as well. But look, the Treasurer acknowledges there's certainly some room for improvement. The wellbeing framework is really about the longer term, broader trends in our economy and our society. We've been upfront in the document in saying there are areas where there are data gaps, where we've had to rely uh, on different kinds of information. But part of the motivation is to make sure that we can do a much better job of measuring things. It's a work in progress, uh, in other words. In the long term, this will be worthwhile as an additional yeah. read on how we're all going. But what do you think at the moment? Does it, is it worth much? I think it's a shame that on two pretty critical points that we as a nation are following so closely around how much money you're spending on a mortgage and around mental health that they didn't have the ability to get more up-to-date data because it immediately kind of suggested, well, how much can we rely upon this report uh, to tell us the story of what's going on? Life expectancies up, chronic illness also up. I, th I thought it was interesting to see that more full look at what Australia is coping with. But the fact that some of that data was out of date, which the government says it couldn't help, I think is a shame for the, mm. for the message. Yeah, well, Jacob, what do you think? And who is this for? Is this for the public or is it for the government? What's the idea here? Oh, that, that's a really good question. I mean, in terms of the data, data is always out of date. You know, the Hilda thing is always is old, you could argue. Just explain the, what the Hilda the, is. The, the, the <laughs> longitudinal, let's not get too nerdy here, but the longitudinal <laughs> the state of people's finances over and time. And that's and produced they every year already. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's every few years. Yeah. Right. Uh, or the census. It's a year after it comes out, you know, after it's done. So old data, yeah, I, I have some sympathy for Chalmers on that. Um, it's, it, you could also have got most of this stuff from the ABS website on yep. any given day. He's just collated it into a nice document. So to go to your point, who's it aimed at? He, he's trying to broaden the debate out about what we value in this economy. Um, the, 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 but the bottom line is the reason we go back to GDP and jobs every time is because those things pay for all the rest of the things. Hmm. If you're not getting those things moving, you're not going to be a country that fixes the other problems. And if you I don't, don't have a job, you're going to have a lot of other problems. For instance. There's, there's, I think that that's true. But I, I don't think it's... Remember when it was first um, promised when Labor was in opposition, you know, Josh Frydenberg, who was then Treasurer, mocked Jim Chalmers and said he'd come out of an ashram and it was Flowing like... Flowing robes. It's all, it's all funny, burning, right? Like, yeah. It's all very funny. Parliament. But also... It was also quite funny. offensive. It was, it was really offensive to the... All very funny. Community. That's why I'm saying funny yeah. with... Sorry, in case I'm be, me, getting missed. Not yeah. that funny. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, what's wrong with knowing how we're going on the other... As journalists particularly, we should be very curious about our broader well-being and how we're going on all of the metrics. And for voters too, right? A, a number of other countries do this already, New Zealand, Canada and so on. Um, if, if voters want to have a way to measure the performance of government beyond those economic stats, they might be really interested. They might care a great deal about mental health, for example, or whatever it is. 
and this gives voters uh, a bit more information but, but to if, about if, how government. If you're doing 40 or 50 different indexes, <laughs> you're always going to have someone very unhappy yeah. that there wasn't enough you know, improvement. Yeah. So there's a political risk there. there. There is definitely a political risk, but that's... I don't care. Uh, I, I like to see how the nation's going on lots of different fronts. I More do think jobs are the most risk. important, yeah. but I also think that other things in your life that matter. affect you yeah. do matter. Now, to that end, the government's hoping to uh, improve the quality of our higher education sector, this review process that's... Well, it's still underway. This week we saw the interim report released, the University's Accord, uh, it's called, conducted by Professor Mary O'Kane. Um, look, the, the final report will come at the end of the year and it feels like we're still waiting for the big stuff in terms of reform to come, but... What is this interim report telling us so far about the state of the university sector, Anna? Well, I think we have that initial uh, announcement from Jason Clare around trying to deal with that question of disadvantage, trying to encourage more people um, from disadvantaged backgrounds to get to university. And he's got a personal reason to try and uh, do that. He was the first person in his family to go past year mm -hmm. 10. Uh, it's also been about trying to be more inclusive to Indigenous uh, school leavers so that they can progress into university if they're not in regional or remote areas. There's more access and it's about saying we want a more level playing field. But some of those bigger questions down the line about how to massively increase the number of people going to university seem very challenging for the government and very expensive. Uh, and, and also just the idea that our economy is changing, that people will be required on much more uh, occasions to have a tertiary education. Like that's, a, that's a big change. Well, it is. And I, I want to come to that. I mean, the initial step, though, that's been announced this week, helping uh, get more Indigenous students in urban areas into university, mm. seems like a no-brainer. Uh, yep. if, if that can be achieved. Um, really important. Yeah, but the, the, the tough one is going to be unscrambling the changes the Morrison government put in place. This is the job-ready graduates uh, idea that has meant teaching in, and nursing degrees and so on deemed in high demand were, were really slashed in, in price, but humanities courses uh, really jumped, so arts degrees mm -hmm. and so on. Now, the review... Um, the universities and the minister, Jason Clare, all agree it's just not working. It has not worked. It hasn't worked. You know, the, the, the intention the government had was by changing the rates that you would create an incentive for some students to do teaching and nursing rather than arts. We've got more people studying arts today than we did a couple of years ago. Different groups have got different ideas about whether you get rid of it altogether. Yeah, and that's the thing, PK, it's not being unscrambled just yet. No, and actually there was a lot of disappointment from uh, the humanities sector about that, that the government hasn't been more bold or done something earlier. Um, so I think they have disappointed on, on that front. But as you rightly point out, it's a lot more complicated. I mean, I was like, can't they just sort it out? But it's clearly a lot more complicated and has implications. For instance, the cheaper degrees, what do you do with them? Yeah, Who is. pays? How do, you, how do you afford it, particularly given the situation we're yeah, in? Jacking up the fees for teaching yeah. students, nursing students ain't necessarily... <laughs> But, but we all <laughs> knew when it was introduced that it was deeply problematic for so many reasons. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. The fact that we've got more people studying humanities uh, in this country, we should celebrate the fact that we're good at humanities. <laughs> and um, and I, I, clearly the government wants to move to that culture, but actually paying for it is a whole well, different Paying for it, Jacob, because this report also indicates we're going to need, what is it, 300,000 more uni students by 2025, 900,000, so nearly a million by 2050. Who is going to pay yeah, it, for that? Amazing number and an amazing cost. And good on Jason Clare for actually, you know, getting this committee to ask spiky questions or come up with yeah. spicy answers. I can't remember the phrase. I it like is. spiky. Spiky spicy. or spicy. Spiky. You know, we do need a proper debate about this. Mm. Um, I, I think what's been really interesting with the policy that the former government had by raising the cost of humanities degrees and lowering the cost of nursing and teaching kind of has highlighted people are still racing into humanities degrees. There's been no... It hasn't killed the demand the cost for is it. not... And it's an interesting that. thing. Are students saying, is university about learning how to learn or is it about getting accredited for something really specific. Now, you come out of university, you've got a 40-year career ahead of you. Maybe these kids live longer. They've got a 50-year career ahead of them. Do you need to have a specific set of skills on the university sticker? 
or do you need a broader set of skills that, that help you point. develop multiple yeah. careers. Now that, that debate's wrapped up in all of this and it's mm. interesting to see the government having a go. Yeah, at it, and it, look, it's not going to be easy, but yeah, you're right. The, the process here of having a proper review, leaving everything on the table, considering it feedback, let's consult on this, is the right way to, uh, right way to approach it. Look, uh, a, a final one. Uh, this week we saw surely one of the nation's highest paid public servants, mm. Catherine Campbell, suspended without pay. Uh, this follows the, um, the damning findings in the RoboDebt Royal Commission. Uh, Catherine Campbell was the Secretary of the Human Services Department. She was then moved after Labor came to office to a senior role in AUKUS. They decided not to get rid of her altogether but put her in an advisory role in uh, AUKUS. But um, she has now been stood aside effectively, as the Prime Minister confirmed. I think that that um, action which is taken, uh, of course, uh, most people who have a look at uh, the human tragedy that was caused by RoboDebt and the findings of the Royal Commission are very, very clear about failings in by the Morrison government uh, and indeed before going back to when Scott Morrison was the minister, but also some failings uh, with the bureaucracy as well. And it's appropriate that there be a response to that. Yeah, so my understanding is the Royal Commission was handed to the government on the Friday. Um, they delivered this news to Catherine Campbell on the, on the Monday, so pretty quickly. And it was Glyn Davis, the head of the Prime Minister's department, who interestingly is one of the very few who's seen the sealed section of the RoboDebt report, the Royal Commission report, who made this call. Mm. Uh, she is the most high profile scalp now of the Royal Commission to start with. I do you think that there was a bit of a lack of transparency around the way that this has unfolded. We didn't really know all the details. The Prime Minister then confirmed it in that interview, but we, uh, you know... Yeah, the Canberra Times had the story to start off with, as I understand it, and then, you know, it was confirmed by the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And it, in fact, then transpired that it was quite a few days prior. But defence wasn't the, the, sort yeah. of answering but no one's arguing against on it, right? the decision itself. What about the decision to actually keep her on? I, I think that, 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 I mean, to me, that's just staggering. I can tell you there's a lot of very senior public servants in this town in Canberra who are just astounded. You had a situation where a new government came in, clearly did not have confidence in that bureaucrat, and because they didn't want a night of long knives... They've, they've cooked up this deal to move her to a job getting almost a million dollars a year. She's getting the same as the head of the Department of Defence. And the argument is they didn't want to pay her out, so they gave her right, job Right, but, to but her, the situation's worse now because there's, there's, a, there's money being wasted. You've got, a bunch of, you've got a bunch of senior heads of department who are involved in, mm. in shuffling her to a new job including two ministers and a prime minister. The, the problem with it is there's been very little transparency around it. Oh, and and right. people are 100%. hiding behind sort of workplace stuff. You know, can't talk mm. about it. Mm. Uh, it's all a bit murky. Now there's a code of conduct inquiry to run before we get to the end of this story. Yeah. All right, our panel, Patricia Carvelis, Jacob Grieber and Anna Henderson will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mark Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with Amanda Kopp, who's the political correspondent for the Community Radio Network and National Radio News. And a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Mike. Amanda, you've heard of the voice to parliament. Well, now there's the pamphlet for the people, as the AEC seems to have uh, just published straight up without any editing, formatting, just put them straight up. Yeah, it's pretty alarming and they just go straight up on the website. Yeah. Cathy Wilcox has summed it up beautifully for such a simple sort of yes, no answer. There's an awful lot of words involved. Can we condense all we hope to achieve into 2,000 words for the yes campaign? And for the no campaign, how do we stretch something bad might happen out to 2,000 words? Yeah. I don't really know whether Australians are going to read not just one, but two 2,000 two word essays. Even just on the website, they just look boring ads. Yeah. <laughs> this is a beautiful David Rowe cartoon. We've got Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, floating in his no noodle. <laughs> Here he is sitting pretty with his pina colada right after the Fadden by-election win. Yep, Gold Coast poll noodles. Beautiful one day, negative the next. And we've got some pretty alarming things here floating in the pool. Yeah, elbow coming in, the water's muddy. And um, beautiful uh, little touch here. We've got Tony Abbott's um, <laughs> speedos. And nose everywhere. No running, no diving, no details. No, just no. <laughs> Certainly living up to the name of opposition. Yeah. 
lovely Brett Lethbridge, who's channeling the uh, voice, the reality show from Channel 9, going off as the um, women regions and old people uh, aren't really responding to it and it's the young holding up the vote. I know, it's just the young people, people in my generation, Mike. What yeah. are you doing in the boomers? I'm not responsible for my entire age group. Amanda, there's the Commonwealth and then there's the Victorian state wealth and Dan said no. Lovely David Rowe. The uh, second thoughts dash as he's making for the door here, Commonwealth Games 2026. Yeah, we've got Dan Andrews looking pretty relaxed here, to yep. be honest, and it sort of reminds me of his press conference. I've made plenty of tough decisions in my time as Premier, but this wasn't one of them. I wonder whether this got any scent to it, this little whoosh of air here. I really <laughs> hope not. <laughs> There could be all sorts of other sports. The uh, leave you in the lurch lunge. The um, you know there's 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 a there's a wealth of games here that Fiona Kataskas has picked up on. Forget the Commonwealth. It's the Australian Games with the race to the bottom. Look at those consultants go. The hurdles here, state school underfunding. We've got pretty low bar for the private school students Yeah, and here. a very high bar for the state schools who've got to get over. I know, an almost impossible bar. Beautiful archery here with the Prime Minister going for carbon emissions. It's his small target practice. <laughs> Not doing very well, is he? At least it's hitting the board. <laughs> Uh, I did love this, Matt Golding, the fundraiser. Uh, our next auction item is hosting the Commonwealth Games. Who would like to start me off? It's only been driven once by Dan Andrews. Almost yeah. brand new. Yeah, they didn't really have a lot of people lining up to say, we'll take on the Games, don't worry, Dan. Amanda, the Senate inquiry into consultancy suggested it was only a few bad apples, but it seems to have gone right to the core, doesn't it? I mean, Alan Moyer thinks uh, you could say you're anything. Tell them you're an escapee, tell them you're a drug runner, but don't mention you're a partner at PwC. No, it's not exactly flavour of the month, is it? A beautiful David Pope. You're up on your bird knowledge. Tell us about cuckoos. I am. I love this one. Cuckoos are the parasites of the bird world where they kick out other birds' eggs, like here, smashed on the floor, and they get other birds to look after their young instead. So we have the poor public servants servicing the consultants. Who's helping who here? <laughs> I think they're onto us. Thank goodness we're now indispensable. Finally, John Kadelka is making a statement. I'm still calling it the bomb. The Bureau of Met here, they're walking in. On the bright side, I don't have to get up that ladder so often these days as there's no days uh, since the hottest day on earth. Don't you love some existential dread to end the week? Yeah, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Back to you, Spearsy. Some kind Amanda, of... Mike, thank you very much. For that, let's get some final observations. Anna, to you first. So there have been 437 referrals to the NAC so far, wow. but only 12% relate to what they're describing as well-publicised matters. So therefore, a substantial number of referrals, we'll see where they go, uh, that don't relate to issues that we are in the media aware of. Interesting. Mm. Jacob Spikey. Um, like 1970s fashion, um, industry policies coming back with a vengeance. Uh, interesting debate kicked off last week by the Productivity Commission. Government, government doesn't agree that, uh, you know, the criticism of using public money to set up things like battery factories in Australia. Interesting debate to roll on that. Yeah, long way to go on that. PK. OK, as I'm in full World Cup fever. I Have you, sorry, every <laughs> opportunity to bring it on. And this week, the Gender Equality Symposium is on Thursday and Friday, led by Penny Wong and Annika Wells, who is the sports minister, who, can I say, was speaking about 20 minutes after Daniel Andrews made the announcement and addressed uh, the cancellation. Right. I think Susan Lee said she hadn't spoken. She had. She was next to the Queensland Premier. But this is going to be a really key event. It was funded by the government as part of sort of a legacy for the World Cup and will be about, you know, they'll meet with the Afghani women's uh, soccer team. It's all about women's leadership and right. I'm really looking forward to that this week. Good one. Alright, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Now, we mentioned earlier the uh, wellbeing budget. One measure that wasn't included was the pub test or more precisely the schooner test. We'll leave you with Susan Lee's front bar concern about the cost of living squeeze. Thanks for watching. I visit businesses where their electricity bill has jumped 30%. I talk to people who are sitting having a quiet beer in a pub on a Sunday afternoon and working out that, you know, they'll get three schooners from their jug of beer and then they might have to go home. I mean, this is awful for a lot of Australian families. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.